Let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we beg your presence. We thank you for your presence and your trustworthiness. We ask that you preside over this time together. Bring your spirit. Let there be an anointing upon me so that my words might be your words. May you give me a share in the eloquence that St. Anthony of Padua had. May I touch the lives of every one of those that is assembled here watching. May you also bless them, anoint them, so that their ears might be open to receive the gifts that you have to give them. May their hearts be open so that they might live in confidence out of those gifts. And may what we do here today bring great glory to you. We ask all this through the name above all names, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hello, my name is Anthony Gallegos, and I'm an instructor with the Denver Catholic Catechetical School, as well as its coordinator for enrollment. I want to thank you for joining us here today. Our time together is meant to introduce you to the school, to give you a lecture, sample lecture, and provide for you what you need to make an informed decision as to whether or not to join the catechetical school. So the first thing I want to do is just talk to you a little bit about where we're at, where we come from. I'm part of the St. John Vianney Theological Seminary. And most of the time you think about a seminary, you think about the formation of priests, which is certainly what happens here. But this seminary is kind of unique in that we have a lay division. And the mission of that lay division is to bring people into communion and a relationship with the living God, Jesus Christ. And the reason we want to do that is because it's only through Jesus Christ that we can be presented to the Father to receive his blessing. And so, to put that another way, our mission is to make and mature disciples. And the way that the catechetical school does that is through lessons that cover the catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, some of you may have this book, and many of you probably use it as a reference, which is an excellent way to do it. You can treat this like you would an encyclopedia, taking a look at the index and then following up with whatever information is in there. But there's another way, a much more challenging way and a much more fruitful way to engage this book because this book has a narrative thread that runs through it, much like the Bible. And this narrative thread is a journey from blessing to blessing. And it's this journey that we want to unpack for you when you become a student for the catechetical school. And so the first part of our time together is really going to be kind of an orientation about just that book, giving you an introduction as to what the book itself is. That'll take a little bit of time. And then it'll be the lecture proper, which will be the bulk of our time together. So in order to understand the catechism, first thing we want to understand is that there's four pillars to the catechism, four sections, four major topics of study. And in the catechetical school, you'll be studying all four of those topics. But to kind of give you a, a, the, the context of the catechetical school within uh, the story of salvation, you know, that story starts with God, right? He's infinitely perfect and blessed in himself. And in a plan of sheer goodness, he decides to create man so that man can be invited to live and breathe in his own divine life to receive his blessing. And so Adam and Eve are created. So we've got God and we've got Adam and Eve. And it was a simple thing to say yes to this love relationship that God had invited them into. But you and I both know the story. They said no, they rebelled. And we call that the fall. And in this fall, they fell so far and they hit the ground so hard, so to speak, that they became broken. Not utterly depraved, mind you, but from here forward, humanity is traveling along this path in this wobbled, hobbled fashion. Okay? And life becomes one thing after another, one rat race after another. But despite the rebellion of Adam and Eve, God doesn't give up on them. He continually sends prophets to bring them back, to orienteer humanity back to him. He develops a nation of the chosen people, a people unto himself, the people of God, his own family, that is meant to be um, brought up and matured so that they can be a witness and a preparation to the rest of the nations. Again, God the Father doesn't give up on his people, and in the fullness of time, he doesn't just send these prophets but he sends Jesus Christ himself, the very Son of God, the only begotten one. And in the incarnation, 
God himself enters into the human mystery and therefore the human misery. And through the ministry of Jesus Christ, he dies on the cross and provides for us this ladder of ascent, this way back to the Father, this avenue, this conduit to get back home. And our program is called the Ladder of Ascent. And this program has four rungs to it, which correspond beautifully to those four pillars of the catechism that I had mentioned. So let's take a look at what those pillars are because those pillars, those rungs, are going to be the object of our study. Now, I mentioned that there were four. The first is going to be the creed. And the creed, for all intents and purposes, really can be considered the story of salvation in history. So it's the Bible kind of compact into these 12 articles of the Apostle Creed. Now, if we look at this um, ladder of ascent as being a journey and correspond that to this idea of this narrative thread that runs through the catechism, a couple of things that we're saying here. One is that the catechism, much more than just being a reference book, is this story of a journey from blessing to blessing. And ultimately, that's the narrative thread that runs through it. So yes, it's good to read the catechism and treat it like you would a dictionary, but it is super powerful when you read it from cover to cover, like a novel, because in there, there's the full disclosure of what this ladder of ascent is. And so that first chapter, that first rung is, as I mentioned, the creed. And because it's the narration in miniature, it's going to disclose to us who God the Father is, what his nature is like. You know, what does it mean to be triune? It's also going to disclose to us something about ourselves. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be made male and female? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about our relationship with God. And we'll also talk about the relationship that we have with the created universe. So to go back to this analogy of this journey, this journey from blessing to blessing, we could think of the creed as being something like a roadmap disclosing to us where we're at, which unfortunately is still in this broken, sinful world. But God wants us to be here with him in heaven. And so that creed will provide us all the tools that we need to properly orient us towards the beatific vision, towards our telos, our end, the reason for which we were designed. Well, the second rung of that ladder, the second pillar of the catechism is the sacraments. And the sacraments are important because they're actually going to give us the supernatural ability to complete the supernatural journey. Because when we look at the creed, we're very quickly going to see that this journey that God is calling us to is impossible to partake. Let me just give you just one quick example. So when Jesus is in his ministry, you know, one of the things that he says is, love your enemies. Love your enemies? Really? Yeah, and love them while they're persecuting you. That's not natural. That's a supernatural call to love. I have difficulty loving my wife, and I love her. I have chose her, and she makes really, really good chocolate chip cookies. And so we see that this journey that we're called to, this uh, climbing of this ladder, it's, it's impossible to accomplish on our own. But thanks be to God, Christ has given us the sacraments. And in these sac seven sacraments, the fullness of of the blessing that he wishes to bestow upon his people is both revealed and communicated. To match that up to the analogy of this journey of blessing to blessing that we're bringing together, the idea is, is that the sacraments are going to provide us with that supernatural equipment in order to climb this ladder. So it's going to give us the parkas for when it rains. It's going to give us the ice hooks so that we can have sure footing on the way up. It's going to give us everything that we need to accomplish this mission. One of the beautiful parts of the disclosure of the uh, sacraments in the second rung, the second semester, is that we begin to understand the power that has been unleashed on us in these sacraments. And the more that we understand what that is, the more confidence we have in our be ability to cooperate with the graces that God has given us to be the saints in the world that God needs us to be. Now, those first two rungs are going to constitute the first year of study. And so this first year of study is going to comprise one academic year. We generally start in September and we end usually the last week of May. Ample opportunity for you know, vacations for Christmas and Easter and things of that nature. But you're looking at that academic year, around 30 weeks of study. 
Well, there's a second year of study, which is going to entail the other two rungs of this ladder. The first of those rungs is morality. Morality is how to live, you know, how to live in accord with God's laws, in accord with his will. And, you know, so many times people say the church has so many of these rules. Well, if you're seeing them just as these rules kind of imposed from the outside, they're going to be difficult to follow. But what the catechism discloses is that these rules, this moral life, this way of acting and orienting your life and, and this attitude with which you approach life really is spiritual worship. And so this morality is our response to the blessings that have been revealed and bestowed on us through the creed and through the sacrament. Another way to put that is that it's our response and love back to God. And interestingly enough, these uh, ethics, these moral tenets, they're really for our benefit. They teach us how to live and how to live well so that the joy that we have is real joy and joy that sustains. Okay. Using this idea of that analogy, of this journey of blessing to blessing. So we've got that broad picture roadmap, and we've got that supernatural uh, equipment to, to enter into this journey. Well, the section on morality is gonna kind of be that very specific moment to moment, you need to step here to climb this ladder. You want to avoid that, because uh, you're gonna fall off. This is the middle ground here that is safest, okay? It's going to be those rules as to how to live day to day. And then finally, the last rung, the last pillar of the catechism is going to be about prayer. Ultimately, prayer is intimacy with God. And so back to this analogy of this journey to blessing and blessing, by the time you're at the level of prayer, this fourth rung, so notice that it comes last, really what prayer becomes is this oxygen mask because at that height, the air gets pretty thin up there. And so we're gonna need this constant infusion of grace this constant way to continue to um, unfold and live in the power of the sacraments that we've received. And so prayer is about intimacy with God, and it's also about unfolding all of his gifts in a very moment-to-moment -moment experience. And I have to say that every student that the catechetic school has ever had, bar none, has said that this last pillar, the pillar the rung on uh, prayer has been the most impactful and the most beneficial. And I think part of the reason for that is that in the catechism, there's just these universal precepts as to what prayer is. And so whether you're, you're the novice who has difficulty in establishing a prayer life and in understanding what prayer is, or even if you're the master, it's going to give you good, solid information that is applicable to whatever it is that your spirituality turns out to be. Again, this is a two-year program, so those second rungs, morality and prayer, is what's covered in that second year. The second movement of our time together is going to involve that sample lecture that I mentioned. And we really want to be able to give this to you just as a freebie, in part for your own knowledge and edification as Christians, but also really to give you an idea of how it is that we teach and what it is that we teach, at what level that we teach, etc. And the topic that I've chosen today comes right out of the catechism. We're going to be exploring what it means to be made in the image and the likeness of God. Now, it's a curious thing in the Bible. Sometimes, you know, words are put together and they don't really mean a lot different one from the other. For instance, when it says, you know, that the law of the Lord is my rod and my staff, may it be my surety. Well, there's not a whole lot of difference between a rod and a staff. You know, it's just meant to be a poetic repetition. But in other cases, when we hear things like image and likeness, those are radically different things. They're interconnected, mind you, but they have different meanings. And it's important for us to know what these meanings are because you and I are made in the image and likeness of God. And that image and likeness is a theme that goes throughout the catechism, throughout the story of salvation history. And it really speaks to what the ministry of Jesus Christ is because in the beginning, our image and likeness was in proper relationship with God. After the fall, it falls apart. But what I want to focus in on now is what is the difference between image and likeness? What is image? What is likeness? So 
essentially what we're going to be doing is unpacking Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And here we see and hear that God says, you know, let us make man in our image, let us make him. In our image and likeness, let us make it. And so again, we want to understand what it is to be made in the image and likeness of God. Well, if we go a little further into scripture, we hear that Adam is built from the clay of the earth. You know, he's the mud man, as my wife sometimes reminds me when I track mud into the kitchen. Hey, Adam, clean up your mess. But we can see that God is sculpting this, this man out of the things of the earth, something like a, an artist would be doing with, out of marble or something like that. But then there's something interesting that happens. It, scripture tells us that this ruah is breathed into the nostrils of the sculpture and man becomes a living being. This ruah, this breath of life, this essence of God is placed into man. And in part, what is being placed into man to make him this living being is the image of God. In other words, man has a soul. And that soul is meant to image God. It's meant to imitate God. And it's designed to put humanity in relationship with God. So the soul is immaterial. And because it's immaterial, because it's a purely a spiritual principle, it's actually impossible to imagine what a soul is. And nevertheless, what I'm going to do is introduce you to Stick Figure Joe, because I want to be able to draw and sort of graph the powers or the faculties of the soul. And at least in Western philosophy, these faculties have been traditionally associated with different areas of the human body. Before we get there, though, I want to ask you, you know, what are these faculties? What are these powers of the soul? You know, if you've studied Western philosophy, you probably know what the answers are. But even if you haven't, I'm willing to bet you know at least some of what those faculties and powers are. So a similar way to ask that question, to arrive at that same information, is to ask you, what makes us different from the animals? What makes you different from Fido the dog? My guess is that some of you would say, well, you know what? We can think. We can reason. And that would be one of the first faculties that I want to focus in on. The power of reason, which is the intellect. All right. So what is this business of the intellect? How does that put us in imitation of God? Well, for one thing, it's our ability to reason, particularly our ability to abstract, that imitates God. So think about it. God is the creator of the universe. And when he creates, he does something incredibly wonderful. He takes nothing, very slippery stuff, this nothing, and he brings something forth from it. Well, he's the only one who can do that. Nevertheless, when humans create, and I'm putting it in quotes because it's not in the technical sense, but we do imitate God because what we can do are rearrange things from the material universe in a way that the material universe has never seen before. That imitates God. So to say that again, we can bring things into the material universe that the material universe has never seen before. So just follow me here for a minute. At one point in human history, there were nothing that even resembled chocolate donuts. Truly a dark time this must have been. But what happened is that some clever individual sees the essence of donut. It was probably a boring glazed donut. But they see that essence, they see that goodness, and for lack of you know, precision, that person takes a photograph of that glazed donut. And that enters into their spiritual being, into this power of the intellect. And it resides there. That form of that donut is there. And then the same individual runs across chocolate. Same thing happens. The experience of the chocolate is impressed upon that individual's mind. And then something beautiful happens within the intellect. This person in their imagination takes the essence of donut and the essence of chocolate, and now we have a chocolate donut. And then that individual goes to you know, an oven and bakes this chocolate donut. And then of course, the people of the kingdom rejoice. We now have chocolate donuts in the world. Now, that's kind of a silly example, but when you think about things like planes, for instance, the fact that we can travel from New York to London while eating a a turkey dinner, it gets pretty amazing. But again, this is meant to imitate the power of God. This is part of the dignity of what it is to be made human. 
But I also said that these powers of the soul are meant to put us in relationship with God, in contact with God. Well, ultimately, the intellect, the ability to reason, is meant to know what the truth is. And it finds peace when it discovers truth, which is another way of saying it finds peace when it finds God. Because God himself is truth, capital T. And so our intellects are designed to seek and rest in the truth. So again, this power of the soul is made to uh, put us into connection, into relationship with God. All right, there are two other faculties of the soul. What's the other one? Okay. You might say, well, okay, let's return to that original question. What makes this different than fight on the dock? And some of you may have thought, well, you know, we have a will and it's free, so we can make decisions where animals work off of instinct. That would be absolutely correct. So the will is this next faculty, and its job, its power, if you will, is to choose. And it's free to do that. And ultimately, it's free to choose either good or evil. So once again, we can see how that, that puts us into um, relationship with God. Okay? God is love itself. And so we're invited to enter into love and to love love and to allow love to love us. That is the power of the will. Now, how does the will imitate God? Good question. So whereas the, um, God's will is also free, free to love. And so when we love, we are imitating God. Now, sometimes we don't do that or we don't do it well. We'll talk about that here uh, a little later on. But that will is that other faculty of the soul. Now, when it comes to stick figure Joe, I said that these faculties are associated with different parts of the human body. The intellect is going to be associated with this higher power. And most of the time in the West, we kind of think about that, you know, being the gray matter between our ears. And there's some real truth there. That organ that we call the brain, you know, is an instrument that the intellect uses. But for philosophical reasons, we place it up here because it's this high, this higher um, faculty, right? And that'll become important in a moment. The will is going to be associated with the heart, okay? The will is the center of the person. The will is the place of the covenant, the place where we decide for truth or against truth, where we decide to love or against love, where we decide to act in compassion or to act in hatred. So the will really is the center of the individual. It's what makes the person a person. If someone pursues love, then they become good lovers. If someone pursues something other than love, well, then eventually that's what they become. The other thing that's kind of interesting about the will is that we can be turned on this, this rotating mechanism so much so that because of our decisions, our intellects might actually be pointed towards the earth. And we can bury our intellect into the earth, never really activating it. Okay, so we've got the intellect and the will. There's a third faculty of the soul, and I'm just going to mention this um, so that we can complete, <laughs> complete our chart. I won't say too much about it. It's probably the one that's the most difficult to arrive at as well, unless, again, you've been trained. But this third faculty is going to be the faculty of the memory. So memory is a curious thing. You know, memory can provide for us uh, continuity. It can provide for us personality. We can build character off of events that we draw from, from the past that then teach us of how to act properly in the future. So memory is, is huge. And again, this imitates God in that God is eternal. So he doesn't have time. Everything that God experiences is just the eternal now, this one moment, this this today, <laughs> this eternal today. But with humans, we can go back to the past and draw forth an experience from there, bring it to the present, examine it, and then even plan for the future using that past experience. And so in some sense, this gives us a foretaste of what eternity is like. And so in that sense, it imitates God. Okay. Now, 
There's one other thing that we should mention, and this isn't a faculty of the soul, but it's going to be important to the rest of the story. So even though it's outside of the, the powers of the soul, again, it's important for us to cover. And that's going to be the passions. Now, interestingly enough, these passions are associated with the loins, you know, our groin. They're the, they're the lowest thing that we have. Not a power of the soul, but it acts as a bridge from the sens sensible world out there into our soul. And for um, kind of an easy definition of the word passions, it's our emotions. Okay? It's what motivates us to do this or to avoid doing that. Those are the passions. And so this is what it means to be made in the image of God. What does it mean to be made in the likeness of God? And well, that's, that's a different creature. And so to understand what it is to be made in the likeness of God, we have to know something about what God is like. So now I'm going to draw another graph. Okay? And for those that will become students of the catechetical school, when we study the Trinity, we'll go after it with much more precision than what I'm offering now. So just kind of keep that in mind, right? But to understand what it is to be like God, we have to understand something about God. And for the Catholics out there, we automatically know something about God, right? He's triune. There's one God, but three persons within him. We confess this every time we do one of this one of these signs of the cross. So let's unpack that. Let's talk about these three persons. We start with God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. And note that we call him Father. In fact, his son <laughs> specifically taught us to call the first person of the Trinity Father. We should just kind of stop there for just a moment. You know, This might be something that we're so familiar with that we kind of lose how profound it is that we can call God Father. In fact, we might lose how profound it is that he desires to be called God the Father. Well, well why? Well, think about it. What's the one thing that's absolutely necessary for a father to be a father? Now, some people might say, well, you know, he needs to create or he needs to care. And these those things are, are part of it, yes. But the one thing that is absolutely essential to the definition of fatherhood is to have some type of offspring, right? some type of other right? that, that springs forth from him. In this case, it happens to be the second person of the Trinity, the Son. Right? But right off the bat, we learn something amazing about God. We learn that God, although he's one, one in essence, one in nature, one in substance, he's not alone. Okay? And the importance of that is that God is an eternal exchange of love. So in the revelation that there, he is the father and that there's a son, part of what we're saying is that the first person of the Trinity wants to be known as being, his, his, his identity is absolutely tied up into the existence of the other. In other words, you cannot have a father without the son. And so what we see is that and what St. Thomas uh, Aquinas teaches is that the Father is going to pour himself out completely to the Son. Everything that the Father has is going to be given over to the second person of the Trinity, the Son. Now, when you're eternal, that's a pretty big gift. But the second person of the Trinity, who is also God, can actually receive that gift. And what we're taught is that second person will receive the gift, revel in it, find his own identity in relationship to the Father. And then in perfect reciprocation, he's going to give himself and everything that he's been given back to the Father by way of gift. So now we see in God this dynamism, if you will, this kenosis, this outpouring of one to the other. But we've only spoken about two persons of the Trinity. We need to speak of the third. Well, the third person of the Trinity, this Holy Spirit, is this love relationship shared between the Father and the Son. In fact, some of the church fathers have put it in much more romantic terms. They've said that this Holy Spirit is the breath shared between these two lovers engaged in a kiss. So this, again, this Holy Spirit is this dynamism of this love flowing from the Father to the Son and back from the Son to the Father. If you think about it, 
when we understand just this small piece, we're kind of beginning to unlock the mystery of what it is to be Christian, the mystery of what it is to be human, in that we never find who we truly are until we give ourselves away to the other as gift. It's then and in relationship to the other that we find out who we are. But anyway, back to this business of likeness. This is the likeness that we are called to emulate. So if we could use this graph and kind of develop something of a mathematical balance sheet, and we'll place Adam here. As I had said, Adam you know, is, is created from the mud of the earth. He's sculpted, but then this breath of life is poured out to him. Well, this breath of life essentially is the Holy Spirit, which gives him the, the soul and the powers there within. But if you look at this graph, we see that there's a whole lot of ink on the top part and then just Adam and a whole lot of white space on the bottom. So in order to be like God, this needs to balance. This needs to flesh itself out. So again, we return to the story in Genesis. What's the story? Well, Adam is you know, paraded. All the animals are paraded before Adam. He's allowed to name them. And at the end of that passage, he looks kind of downcast. You know, he's alone. And we could almost kind of imagine God the Father being like, what was I thinking? You know, it's not good for man to be alone. Okay? And so he puts Adam into this deep sleep, this ecstasy. And from Adam, he draws out this rib. And around this rib, he creates Eve. Okay? All right. So now when Adam wakes up, he exclaims, you know, that, that beautiful triumphant expression of gratitude and glory, you know, at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. What he's seeing, who he's seeing in Adam is the solution to his problem. He's called to be like God, but in solitude, he can't be. He needs an other to love. He needs someone to share this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's been given to him. And so if we follow the biblical narrative, we see that Adam can now be more like God in that Adam has someone to love, Eve. So another way to say that is we could call God the Father, the lover, and God the Son, the beloved. Adam, therefore, then takes the role of the lover, the initiator of the gift, if you will. Eve is going to be the receiver of the gift, the one who is the beloved. And in imitation of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, Eve is going to take this gift of love from Adam, again, revel in it, and give it back. So now we're starting to balance this mathematical equation out. But there's one person that's being missing here. And who might that be? You could probably guess. It's going to be the third. It's going to be the offspring of Adam and Eve, the child who, in human terms, if you think about it, is the fleshly existence and combination of these two individuals coming together, which is that very real and visible um, symbol, if you will, of the love shared between husband and wife. So this is what it is to be like God okay? in community, because God, again, is in solitude. He is love, and love demands that there be someone to love someone who you can give yourself away and gift. Well, in the human family, we now see uh, when love is expressed this way, that they are like God. Now, real quick, we could have drawn this uh, same bottom part of the, uh, the balance sheet here using a priest and the bride of his parish. We could talk about a consecrated virgin and her service to the church, etc. But because all of us come from families, I've decided to use that human family. But you can see how we are at uh, this, this image, which is now complete. We are like God. So to wrap all this up and make it super simple is that we are like God when we choose to love. So this is what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. And it's important because this image and this likeness undergo some pretty radical changes during the fall. So now we want to get into a discussion about what happens to both the image and the likeness after the fall. And that's going to behoove uh, you know, a, a conversation about, well, what was it to be in the image and likeness before the fall? 
Now, many of you are familiar with the term, you know, original sin. Right? How many of you are familiar with original justice or with original holiness? Probably not too many. So when we look at the image and likeness, both before and after the fall, also what we'll be doing is looking at original sin and what was lost, which is original holiness and original justice. So let's take a look at original justice first, just because it's the simplest to understand. Original justice is the state that Adam and Eve were created in, in that they walked with God, which would be the biblical expression. It meant that they were created in friendship with God. So they knew God, they walked with him, they had original holiness. Now, original justice is going to entail three original harmonies. These harmonies um, are going to correspond in a very real way to what it is to be made in the image of God. So let's take a look at these original harmonies. So I'll write OH for original harmony, and there are three of them. The first is called integrity. Integrity is going to reference this idea and this reality that the human person was integrated, which meant that their body and their soul were absolutely in conformity one with the other. There was no battle or warfare that occurred in original integrity. It also means that those faculties of the soul uh, did their jobs and did it in their proper place. So remember how we had drawn stick figure Joe and we placed the faculty of the intellect up here. Okay? It's the higher faculty, if you will. And the reason for that is because it informs the will based off of what it truly sees and what it truly has grasped as truth and suggests to it you know, the proper path. And then it's the will that chooses that, informed by this intellect. Okay? This intellect is going to have been illumined. It's going to have a pristine grasp on things. Okay? And so it could inform the will properly. Now, the passions, which were that, that, uh, that lower part that we spoke about, is then going to be commanded by the will to go after the things that are good for it in the right way. This is part of what we mean when we say integrity. The other part, as I had mentioned earlier, is that the body and the soul were integrated. There wasn't any warfare that had taken place. So oftentimes what you and I experience <laughs> post the fall is that our bodies and our souls sometimes do kind of war with each other. In fact, just a few days ago, you know, uh, the alarm clock is what woke me up. And my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. You know, my mind is thinking, okay, get up, you gotta get up. You know, it's time to get ready for class. You gotta get those new notes ready. You gotta get all gussied up so that you can present well. And what's my body doing? Almost on its own, it's reaching over to hit the snooze button four times. Okay, so again, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. It wasn't until my wife kicked me out of bed and threatened to, you know, smack me upside the head if that alarm clock went off again that I actually got up. But there was this disconnect that was involved between what my mind, what my soul was telling me to do, and that which my body was kind of forcing me to do. Okay, well, that's original integrity, this original harmony in the faculties of the soul, as well as the soul and its cooperation with and through the body. Another element of original justice, the second original harmony, is going to be something called communion. Communion just means that Adam and Eve were actually in friendship with one another. So original holiness is friendship with God, walking with God, and original uh, justice with reference to the human community meant that they were in union with one another. They were in communion with one or the other. Biblically speaking, the phrase that I think in, encapsulates that concept the best is that they were naked without shame, which meant that they could be who they were without any masks or pretenses. They were simply able uh, to be who they were because the other loved them. So they're able to rest in the gaze of the lover. And again, this is something that gets lost when it comes to original sin and post-fall. You know, now we have to worry about, is my tie straight? You know, um, you know does, does my breath stink? What are they going to think about me? Am I good enough? Okay, but that's not the experience that the first parents had 
in the garden. They had this ability to see one another and to love one another for who they were, plain and simple. This is what original justice is with regards to this original harmony of communion between persons. The third harmony in original justice is something known as dominion. Dominion refers to our first parents' harmony with the created universe. It's interesting to note that the church will teach that creation is a gift addressed to man. And what I like to say is that this created universe was a wedding dowry from God the Father to our first parents to invite them into this love relationship that he had planned for them from the very beginning. And so what this means is that they were the masters of everything that they surveyed. Okay? Um, it also meant that they would never get sick. Okay? Uh, disease and death certainly were not part of the picture in original justice because they were top of the food chain, if you will. Now, this is not what we live now, right? This is not the experience that we have now. What you and I experience is the tragedy of the fall. So original sin is a stripping of these original harmonies. It's a state that we inherit from Adam and Eve of brokenness. When they rebelled, essentially what they said is that we want to be like God, but without God. And so they cap themselves off from the very flow of God into their life. So going back to that original balance sheet that we had drawn a few moments ago, what we see is that Adam puts this stone, rolls this stone over to the cap of his soul so that the Holy Spirit, although desiring to enter into um, Adam, he can't anymore. He's been refused. And God being the gentleman is never going to force himself on somebody. But the tragedy is, is that without this love relationship with God, then humans cannot love one another. And so they lose this likeness. And when Adam no longer is being rejuvenated by the very flow of life that God is, well, then he can't love Eve properly anymore. And the way this is reflected in this scriptural text is that before they were naked without shame, and now they're naked and afraid because Adam is gazing upon Eve, not with this gift of love, but he sees her as an object to be used. And so the scripture tells us they, they cover themselves up. You know, they start to put barriers between the, one another. This is the result of original sin. This is the result of the fall. This is the result of kicking God out of the equation. We lose the likeness of God. And again, we've inherited this through something called original sin. And so rather than these original harmonies, what we experience is a disintegration within the soul, right? which was you know, uh, um, hinted at with regards to me hitting the snooze button so many times. But we could also kind of graphically depict this by saying that man gets turned upside down. And so rather than the reason running the show, rather than things, decisions being based off of truth, Oftentimes, we base decisions off of how we feel, how we react. In fact, you know, uh, in my younger days, occasionally I would do something that was absolutely unreasonable. And my dad would be like, what are you thinking? And I'd be like, well, I don't know. You know I wasn't. Which the more I learn about what it is to be in this fallen world, the more I realize that was a true statement. I wasn't thinking. I was merely feeling, I was merely reacting with my passions. And so we can draw the soul and the human person as being oriented towards the ground with the intellect again being buried. And rather than um, being that primary faculty of the soul, what we see instead is that the passions are running the show. Right? This is not a good place to be in <laughs> because we're creatures of truth and we seek the truth and we shouldn't be basing things off of these mere feelings. It's the bad way to go. So we lose that original integrity. And what we enter into is something called the triple concupiscence. Keep that in mind because when you become a student of the catechetical school, we'll delve even more into this triple concupiscence, this triple tendency to sin. In reference to original harmony, you know, where it's this, it's this perfect relationship, we now have this 
again, this broken, fallen nature where we don't see men and women from being from the Garden of Eden anymore. Instead, we see men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And rather than compatibility, we have the battle of the sexes. This is part of the tragedy that we have. And it doesn't just occur in marriage. It occurs in every walk of human existence when it comes to being in relationship one with the other. And then finally, dominion. Okay? Rather than being masters of the universe, rather than being able to you know, walk without being tired, rather than um, being able to exist in harmony with the created universe, we are now at odds with the universe. Sometimes that universe seeks to destroy us, or at least that's how it feels. And we suffer things like um, the destructive powers of hurricanes and whatnot. We experience death, which was never part of that original plan. It, death comes as the wages of sin. It's only through rebellion that death enters the world. But we do die. We do decay. In fact, I've got gray hair, which is a sign that I'm no longer maturing. I'm actually digging my own grave. I've begun the process of dying. This is part of original sin. Now, to make it more clear with regards to the reference of the image and the likeness, as you can see, the entire orientation of the human person and the faculties of the soul gets turned upside down. Rather than an illuminated integrity, we have a darkened intellect, one that struggles with math, for instance. Um, we see these battle of the sexes and dominion is lost. With the likeness that has been removed, it's part of the consequence of the fall. God is no longer the one that indwells. This is tragic. Yet, the good news of the mission of Jesus Christ and the good news of the rest of what the Catechism has to disclose is how Jesus and his mission and his Paschal mystery, which is continued in the life of the church, particularly through the sacraments, is going to restore all of this, to make it pristine, to begin and to perfect that healing process, both within the soul and with um, this business of the likeness. And that is the beauty and the journey of the Catechism as it goes from here. So returning to those four rungs, I had mentioned that the Catechism you know, is going to be this disclosure of the Father's plan from the beginning, the story of journey from blessing to blessing, this, this healing of both the image and the likeness of God. Well, let's take a couple of examples from the different um, sections of the Catechism to understand what more you can learn. Because again, what Jesus does as the incarnate one is to come and he recapitulates human history. So part of what that means is that he enters again into the human story and everything that humans experience, except for sin, he experiences. But part of the beauty of recapitulation is that not only does he retell the story in his own person, but he tells it with a twist. He finds victory where we have experienced nothing but failure. And then the beauty behind that is that we are invited to recapitulate our stories in his recapitulated victory. So again, the rungs of the catechism are going to disclose how God takes this original sin, this original problem, if you will, and fixes it. So let's just take a quick little survey into the second rung of the ladders of ascent, the business of the sacraments. So in baptism, we get the likeness of God restored to us. So whereas Adam and Eve had capped that off so that the flow of love was no longer permitted and they no longer permitted that flow there, well, original sin is wiped away. That stone, if you will, is removed so that God himself can indwell in the person, thereby restoring the likeness. We now have not only just the mechanical ability to love, if you will, but love itself that is indwelling in us. And that love is meant for our own edification as well as to be shared with others so that we can truly find who we are in relationship to the other. That's no small thing. In fact, at one point, and this wasn't universally taught in the church, but there was this, this small area of the church that uh, spoke of baptism, not as baptism, but as the sacrament of the Holy Spirit, because it, they understood and wanted to emphasize the infusion of the Holy Spirit back into the human picture. 
And as part of that infusion, as part of that restored likeness to God, what we now have is this image of God, which has been turned on its head, is properly oriented back to the Father. So this means a couple of things. One, it means that we have this radical, beautiful ability to call the Eternal One Father, not by way of any analogy, but by way of reality. We truly are made sons and daughters of God. And as part of that dignity, these faculties of the soul begin this healing process. So with regards to the image of God and that faculty of the intellect, we had said that that was become darkened. Well, in baptism, it is illuminated. There's just this supernatural ability to be able to see things as they truly are. This is part of what the gift of faith is, in that we begin to understand the disclosure of reality as given to us by God, and in which some of those things we couldn't have naturally arrived at under our own powers. But God discloses to us these things. And so our intellects do become healed. Okay, that's fancy. And what does that mean? Well, for instance, just the existence of angels. Okay? Angels are purely spiritual beings, which means that there would be no physical evidence, especially since they never create, uh, of their existence. You know, they don't leave footprints in the jello. They don't leave behind small things that they've been whittling away about. So we could never know with certainty of their existence, except that God discloses them and their existence in his word. So that's part of what we talk about, part of what we mean when we say that the intellect is illuminated. The will through baptism is going to be strengthened, strengthened to the point that individuals can go to their own martyrdom smiling. So recall the story of St. Lawrence, right? Poor guy's being roasted like a pig on a spit. You know, what is going on there? Because he looks at those that are persecuting him, torturing him, taking his life, and he says with a smile on his face, Turn me over. I think I'm done on this side. Right? Imagine the impression that that would have left on those that were trying to break him. Right? But that's the strengthening of the will that we can um, expect and in confidence live out of. Because our hearts become attuned to who it is that we truly are and the destiny that is truly ours if we just take the steps to get there. Now, even the memory is made more pristine. In fact, we talk about how the work of the Spirit in the church is to make pristine our memories, to recall the events of the past so that we don't forget. So what we're getting at here is when we go to Mass, for instance, you know, there's the disclosure of the Old Testament and then the New Testament, which is part of our history, part of our story. And the reason that this is brought back to us time and time again is so that we can understand the faithfulness that God had. And we see that there is this pattern of faithfulness. So if he's been faithful in the lives of those Israelites and of those people time and time again, we can recognize his faithfulness in our own lives. And then we can reasonably expect that he's going to be faithful in the future because we've figured out that he's got this nature, and this nature is one of love. And so the Holy Spirit goes into that image and makes it what it was supposed to be. Other ways that the Catechism will disclose the mission of Christ and his healing powers is to just understand at length what the other sacraments have to do with regards to our healing. So we talked a little bit about baptism. Let's just briefly talk about um, the Eucharist. So when we look at the Eucharist, we see that Scripture calls it the wedding feast of the Lamb. And again, notice how this wedding feast of the Lamb is the solution to the original problem. The original problem was that Adam and Eve were made to be in intimate relationship with God the Father. It required their yes, though. God had, so to speak, bent his knee and proposed to them, giving them the entire material universe as that wedding dowry. They said no. Yet, this is why we were made. This is the destiny that has been meted out for us. And so the solution is to enter into that relationship. 
And at the sacrifice of the altar, we enter into communion, both of body, mind, and, and certainly of spirit, with the one that loves us. And so it is this wedding feast. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom, and we're the bride. And we enter into this marital, covenantal relationship, which has its own effects here and also will bear fruit in eternity. And how does this apply to the problem beyond what I've already spoken of? Well, when we take a look at um, back to that story of Adam and Eve, what was the concrete act that they entered into to show their rebellion? Interestingly enough, it was partaking of a forbidden fruit. It's part of a meal. <laughs> kind of curious, huh? And you know, we might think that that was just a problem for Adam and Eve, but we see the same problem of food being perpetuated throughout salvation history, which then suggests to us, and we'll probably recognize ourselves in this, that it's actually a problem for humanity. So what I'm getting at is this whole business of Israel in the wilderness. There was a point where they ran out of food and they grumbled against Moses. In fact, they threatened to kill the poor guy. And so he cries up unto the Lord and the Lord provides quail and manna from heaven. But that manna and its eating comes with a particular prescription and a test. You know, gather what you need just for the day. Okay? Don't gather for the week, don't gather for tomorrow unless it's the Sabbath. Well, some of the Israelites were faithful to that command, others were not. And so they failed the test. And so again, we see that food actually becomes this problem for humanity. And it's a problem in two sense. One, our bodies desire stability. They desire security and safety. Okay? We want to know where our next meal is coming from and we get nervous when we don't. But it also speaks to a deeper problem. Our hearts have this infinite hole within them and only the infinite can fill it. But when we don't trust that the infinite will, sometimes we go after things to try and substitute for it. Oftentimes that manifests itself in too much food, too much drink. So recall perhaps the last time you didn't get that promotion at work or whatever. And so what do you do? You know, you find that box of unopened chocolate chip cookies and you scarf down not just one, two, or three, but the entire box. So again, we try and fill ourselves up with the things of the material universe when what our souls are really longing for is um, that intimate relationship with God. Again, an infinite whole that only the infinite can fulfill. Well, Jesus Christ entering in again to the human mystery and misery suffers the same temptation as Adam and Eve. He suffers the, the same um, temptation as Moses and the people in the wilderness. After his baptism, he's drawn into the desert, you know, led there by the Spirit to fast for 40 days. And at the end of that period, who shows up but the evil one? And what's that first temptation all about? Hey, you, you look hungry. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? But Jesus doesn't. He doesn't fall for that. And yet, nevertheless, what he does do is he sees the truth behind that temptation. He entwists it and unpacks and removes the lie from that. And then he gives us what our heart's desire truly is. Both bodily security as well as infinite God filling that infinite hole. And where does he do this? I've already given you the answer. Hopefully you've made the connection. But he gives us to that, gives us that in the Eucharist, okay? where we are fed okay, with the body, blood, soul, and divinity under the accidents of bread and wine. It's a meal. And it's meant to sustain not only body, but more importantly, the heart. So Jumping ahead into that fourth rung, when we look at prayer, that portion of the program is going to focus in on the Our Father. And again, the Our Father and its repetition and the things that we pray for are very specifically addressing the problem of the fall, that original problem, that original sin. So in what aspects? What's disclosed there? Well, let's just look at that opening line, Our Father. So another way that we could take a look and understand the fall is that Adam and Eve chose to put God in the role of something other than father. 
Perhaps they chose to put him in the role of slave master or someone who was, you know, holding, withholding the best from them. But when Jesus is asked, hey, Rabbi, teach us how to pray, what's the first thing out of his mouth? He says, Abba, call him Father. Let's get this right. Let's get our relationship with him properly understood. He is Father, and he's loving Father, and he desires to give us everything. So much so that I have come to make certain that you understand that he will withhold nothing from you. I will pour out everything that I am for your benefit. And that's proclaimed and professed in the opening words of our Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. Or moving on, that expression, you know, that, that next tenant of that Our Father, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Ah, this has a twofold meaning. And it speaks to what we've already mentioned. It speaks to um, the very immediate needs of our body and our circumstances and the security that we have for the day, as well as the need for the Eucharist. So again, that twofold temptation that Adam and Eve and indeed all of the humanity face, we pray for and petition the Lord to fulfill us both supernaturally and then to just take care of our natural needs. But also, notice it's give us this day. Doesn't say anything about tomorrow. Doesn't say anything about next week. And so again, the disclosure of the Our Father in that fourth rung of the, uh, the ladders of the scent is going to teach us and invite us to learn how to live into the today, the now, the hodie, this eternal moment of God where we can be present to what it is before us and let God take care of the rest, which is a whole other way to live, a whole other orientation of how to experience life. You know, to take responsibility for that which we have responsibility of, but then to let God take care of the rest. I have no ability to concretely and perfectly affect the future. I can fool myself and think that I am, and there is an aspect that's legitimate of trying to plan for the future, but ultimately the future is over there. I don't live in the future, but God does. And so if I learn through the repetition of this prayer, through allowing the graces of what it has to teach me to live in the now, then I'm going to be much further along the road into my own holiness and sanctity. So the beauty of studying the catechism and community um, is that, one, you're going to have a faithful guide. You know, all of the catechetical instructors have taken oaths to remain faithful to the magisterium of the church, and we do our very best to live out that magisterium. But also, you know, without this guide, it can be very difficult to plow through some of those paragraphs. The language is dense, and it's going to take um, a time and an effective guide to get you through it. The other beauty of studying the catechism in communities is that you're going to be held accountable to finishing every last paragraph within that two-year time frame. So the instructor is there to keep you accountable. The mechanism itself is there to keep you accountable but also the people around you, your peers. In fact, we could speak of yet another beauty of the community is that you will learn from me, but you will also learn from those around you. Their insights, their sharing, their perspective. I learn from the community of students every year, things that I had never seen before in the catechism because they're the ones pointing it out to me. So between the instruction, the community, and the communal prayer, you're guaranteed success if you remain faithful to the process. And so once again, I hope you consider becoming a student for the catechetical school. I hope that you found our time together both informative and exciting. And I hope part of that excitement draws you to becoming a student in this school. Thank you for your time. God bless.